How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Welcome to DNA Today. I'm your host, Keir Dineen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. I talk about all kinds of news stories and lessons, all to keep you updated and educated on the ever-changing world of genetics. You can tune in to whus.org or 91.7 FM on the radio if you're in the stores Connecticut area. All episodes are at dnapodcast.com. And today is one of my favorite types of episodes, an interview. Today I'm excited to be joined by genetic counselor Brittany Gankars. She is a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College with a with a science master's degree in human genetics. She's a genetic counselor and clinical instructor at UConn's Health's Genetic and Developmental Biology Department. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. So I want to start with what genetic counseling is, because some people may confuse it with other types of fields. <laughs> what you do, do you counsel crying patients? What is your everyday life? Who do you talk to? All right, so genetic counseling is a pretty diverse field. So what one genetic counselor does might look very different from what another counselor does. But I would say all of us have the goal of interpreting genetic information for people. So we take very complex genetic information and then we interpret it for them in a way that they can understand. So a lot of times that's for patients, sometimes that's for crying patients, <laughs> um, but other times that might be for physicians or other healthcare providers. But our goal is to help take um, that genetic information, which we have a very deep understanding of, and then make it usable and effective for other people. So very good at kind of teaching patients in that education side and translating. It's like you're translating from another language, really. Yes. So um, definitely um, making that information accessible to them. Um, and like you said, being a translator, the educator piece is definitely a big part of genetic counseling. So what do you see patients for? What types of fields are you in? So I'm a prenatal counselor. Um, I see mostly pregnant patients, but I do see some preconception patients as well, um, patients who might be considering starting a family. Um, so most of my patient population, like I said, is pregnant. So when I meet with them, I'm talking to them about different options that they have for testing during their pregnancy and explaining what the benefits and the limitations are of all those different testing options. Um, for our preconception patients, we're usually discussing a specific concern they have, such as a family history or a pregnancy history of a child who might have had genetic concerns. Um, and for some of our pregnant patients, we're discussing family history concerns like that as well. I also meet with people to discuss um, abnormal results in their pregnancy or different abnormalities seen on ultrasounds that might come up. So a lot of what you do is offering genetic tests and explaining those tests. What are the typical tests that um, pregnant women are offered when they come and see you? So mostly, we're fo most of our sessions are focused on talking about screening for different chromosome conditions, such as Down syndrome. So there are a lot of different available tests during pregnancy that patients can have that can either say definitively whether or not their pregnancy is affected with a chromosome condition. Um, but there are also a lot of different screening tests that they might have that show whether their pregnancy is at higher risk for those conditions or if they're at low risk. So most of my sessions are centered around those types of tests. So what are the tests that you offer? There's NIPT we mm -hmm. hear of. What, what else is there? We have quite a few options right now in prenatal counseling. Um, we have um, our newest option is this NIPT or cell-free fetal DNA testing. Um, and this is really sort of shaken up our world in prenatal. Um, and what that is is it's a blood test um, that looks for cell-free DNA that's come from the placenta and is circulating in mom's bloodstream. And that can be used as a very accurate screening test for Down syndrome and some other rare chromosome conditions like um, two called trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. What's really important that we want to educate our patients on is what the test is looking for and how well it works. So it's not enough to say that it's a test for birth defects because it's really specifically a test for those chromosome conditions. It won't be able to pick up isolated heart defects or club foot or any other myriad of different things that could happen during a pregnancy. There's more factors that go into those types. Right, so we might explain if they have a specific question like will this tell me 
such and such about my baby, like will this tell me if my baby has any health problems, then we can talk about how our testing during pregnancy can't ever be for everything, but we build up evidence with these kinds of tests, with ultrasounds, and if all that evidence looks good, then the most likely scenario is that you'll have a healthy baby. So if someone receives an abnormal result that they have possibly a not healthy fetus, mm -hmm. where do you go from there? How do you guide patients into kind of the next step for them? So I think our, our first stop in that abnormal result um, scenario is that we need to understand what kind of testing that they've had and what that abnormal result really means. So in the case of the cell-free DNA testing, a lot of patients will feel like that is a definitive diagnosis for their pregnancy, and it's not. So it's a screening. It's, it's not a screening, test. right? <laughs> yeah. So it's not a diagnostic test, but it tells us about a high or a low risk. So we might start by explaining that to them and saying that even though the chance might be high at this point that the baby has one of these conditions, we still need to talk about what follow-up testing they might do if they really feel like they need that diagnosis or not. And what's the options for follow-up testing if um, a pregnant woman decides to go that route? So if she goes that route, she'd be looking at um, options for two different kinds of tests. Um, one's called amniocentesis, and that's one that more people have heard about. The other one is called chorionic villus sampling, and that's shortened to CVS. So with both those procedures, we're getting cells from the pregnancy to grow in a lab and look at chromosomes. With amniocentesis, we get those cells by taking some of the amniotic fluid out that the baby is surrounded by, and we use the cells that are floating in that fluid. And with the CVS, we're taking a small biopsy of the placenta. The CVS is done a little bit earlier in pregnancy. It's between 11 and the end of 13 weeks, and there's not as much amniotic fluid for us to be sampling at that time. So that's why we use the placenta cells then, and we use amniotic fluid after 16 weeks of pregnancy. So couples can decide to go with one, go with both, depending on their situation? They usually wouldn't do both. Um, they can decide which one to go with. The timing of the two tests plays a, a role in that. Um, another very interesting thing that the cell-free DNA testing has been showing us is how much we had to learn about placentas. <laughs> so the cell-free DNA test is really looking at the genetic information from the placenta, not directly from the fetus itself. So because of that, we can get false positives or false negatives when the chromosomes in the placenta are different from those in the fetus. And usually they're the same, but sometimes they can be different. Exactly. So most of the time we think of those two sets of chromosomes as being the same as one another. But in those cases where they're different, that's where we can get these sort of wonky results where we're seeing one thing on an NIPT test, but then we're seeing another thing in the baby. Do you ever have patients come in that say, I've done my research, I want to do this test? Does that happen often or? That happens sometimes. sometimes. Um, especially with the, the cell-free DNA option, I feel like sometimes people have heard a little bit about it from their friends or their physicians, and they might come in with the thought of like, that's the test I want to do. Um, I would say more often than not, patients have just gotten a ton of information about being pregnant almost more than they know how to grapple with at that time. So a lot of times they've put that information they heard from their doctor about chromosome screening on the back burner. Sounds a little complicated <laughs> to them. Sounds a little complicated to them. And then that, our, my session with them is where we can really review that in detail. And the doctor has a lot of things to cover with them at their first appointment. So I don't really blame them for not going into that much detail because they also have to talk about, you know, what foods are safe to eat, what weight gain is appropriate in pregnancy, you know, how to manage their first trimester symptoms. They're really dealing with a lot of issues that aren't just specific to genetic screening. So the genetic counseling appointment is something where we really can break down all those options um, separately from all those other pregnancy concerns. Now, if a doctor decides that he's going to or she's going to go through with genetic testing and order that on their own, What's kind of the pros and cons compared to having a genetic counselor do that? Great question. So we see patients from offices that refer all their patients to us for genetic counseling before pursuing any tests like NIPT. And then we also work with offices that do the NIPT on their own and then refer their patients with a high risk result to us. And I think both ways can work really, really effectively if they're done right. Um, so some of the differences is that with the patients that we see first before their NIPT, 
we get the opportunity to do pretty thorough pretest counseling with them. Um, and pretest counseling just refers to everything we tell them about the test before they actually go and have it. It also gives them the opportunity to say that they want or don't want that test. And we have already established some kind of relationship with them before those results come back. Um, the Some of the I don't know if I could say that there's a con to that since that's what we do. Right. <laughs> but I guess for the patient's convenience, they can, if their doctor orders the testing, they get to do all the testing right at their doctor without having a separate appointment. I'll also say many of our patients have ultrasounds the same day that they've seen us, so they're not really going out of their way to see us. Just the next uh, office over. Just the next office over, right down the hall. Um, but when the doctors order the tests by themselves and then refer us their high-risk samples, I've seen that go very, very well in many situations. So many times in that situation, the patient with the abnormal result comes to me with what I've thought is like just the right amount of genetic, uh, just the right amount of information. So they know their test came back a little high risk, but this doesn't mean anything for certain and that they're here to talk more about it. Perfect. <laughs> I've had other times, unfortunately, where the patient didn't really realize what the testing was. Before after they, they had gone through it? After they had gone through it, they get their results, and then they are sort of trying to backpedal and learn what the testing was in the first place. And that's a really difficult time for us to be learning new information when we're totally stressed out about a result, especially a result about a pregnancy. So our, the benefit in doing a really thorough pretest counseling is we get to educate them at a time when they're more amenable to learning, where they're sort of more open to taking in new information and they're not in that panic mode yet. They're more in deciding, do I want to go for right. this or not? Um, and they can think about it a little more clear-headed than they'll be able to think about anything when they've heard that there might be something wrong with their pregnancy. Sometimes I think it's also really easy for a chromosome screening test to get sort of lumped in with all the other blood work we do in pregnancy. And a lot of that blood work is sort of non-negotiable. <laughs> you know, we're going to do a complete blood count. We're going to screen you for infectious diseases. And those aren't blood tests that your doctor really has to hash out with you. But they're just standard of care. They're just standard of care. But a chromosome screening test is a little different because it's more uh, can be more sensitive information and it's a test that you really have a decision about it might be useful information for the patient or it might be really burdensome information if that's something that they don't wa want in their pregnancy so this all sounds very expensive to me you've got you know <laughs> looking at chromosomes you're looking at dna and extracting that from maternal versus fetal how much money are we talking? What's insurance's role in all this? That's a great question, and it's a question our patients ask us. I would think that's probably the first on their mind. Not even daily, but I would say per session we get one of those questions. Um, so when we talk about the cost of testing, it's a pretty vague topic because how much a test actually costs can be kind of a murky area. Um, so people can look up what's called the list price of a genetic test. But that list price doesn't really mean a whole lot. So that's almost an arbitrary dollar amount set by the lab, but neither the insurance company nor the patient usually end up paying that amount. So to use um, NIPT as an example, the list price for some of the NIPTs we use is about $2,700. So not something you want to see on the bottom of a bill, definitely. No. <laughs> um, but most of our patients will pay no more than $200 for their NIPT. That's a better number. I like that better, don't you? Yes. <laughs> um, and if their insurance covers it, which is um, certainly very common for patients who are at higher risk to have a baby with a chromosome problem. Most insurance plans are covering the cost of this DNA testing. It, and even for some low risk patients, some of the insurance carriers have started to ex offer coverage for that as well. So how about Medicare, Medicaid? How do they cover more, less for patients that have that? So Medicaid covers um, definitely covers high-risk patients in our state. Um, so one of the labs we work with is contracted with our state's Medicaid. Um, and then through um, an arrangement with the lab, our low-risk Medicaid patients are able to have NIPT at no cost. Um, but the Medicaid is not reimbursing for that at this point. So when patients come in that are not pregnant, mm -hmm. but they're kind of looking at gathering more information before they decide if they want to conceive or not, what type of issues are they discussing with you? What um, are they nervous about and have concerns for? So I'd say a lot of our concerns are for family history concerns or concerns they've had in a previous pregnancy. 
Um, so for example, we might see a patient who's had a pregnancy that had multiple birth defects and may, if that patient decided to end the pregnancy or if that baby died, then they might see us after the pregnancy to say, what are the chances for this to happen again? And we talk to them about what those chances are. Um, many times we have to take some time to gather information and figure out what was going on and what those chances are so that we can pass that information to the patient. And then we also explore with them different options that they might have for a future pregnancy. Sometimes an assisted reproduction option will be available to them to help decrease their chance of having another affected pregnancy. Um, and we can also explore just psychosocially, how are they feeling about pursuing having another child? You know, it definitely changes a person's perspective very deeply to have had a pregnancy that was either miscarried or had a later loss like a stillbirth or was diagnosed with some kind of problem. That makes going into every subsequent pregnancy a very different experience for that person than for someone who's never been through that before. And it helps to make these decisions based on information from a genetic counselor and to really hash that out and understand a lot of different components that go into it. One of the things that I think is is kind of unique and I like to think special about our profession is that it's really a collision between scientific information but then also the human side of things and that's very much part of our training as well. So it's not just information about genetics because many researchers have that that level of genetic information. In fact, when, when I go to some of the basic science talks about genetics, sometimes I think like, that information used to have a home in my brain and now it's been <laughs> back, a little, back in little school. nudged out. Um, but um, we have that genetic information, but what those researchers might not have or they might not care to have is that desire to talk about it with other people. And the ability to actually say things in layman's terms and understand right. <laughs> what general people can understand versus what people in the field understand. And also using your counseling skills to gauge what a patient's level of understanding is. So are they the kind of patient who you can talk about chromosomes and DNA and sequencing with and help explain what all that means? Or are you going to need to use even simpler terms than that? Um, and then using the cues that the patient gives you to say, what do they need right now? You know, is there any point in my explanation that they haven't understood that I might need to go back and review with them. Um, you know, all those are counseling skills that not every scientist has. And there's a high demand for genetic counselors. It's certainly yes. an exploding field to say the least, but there's not enough genetic counseling schools. There really needs to be more in order to attempt to meet these demands. Mm -hmm. Do you want to care to share the exciting announcement for Connecticut's role in this? Um, so um, at UConn, we've been approved um, for funding to start a master's level genetic counseling program, Woo! which we will be doing at UConn stores with both Farmington and stores faculty. <laughs> so it's, it's very We're exciting. Very excited. Yes, it's going to be the first um, public university to have a genetic counseling program. In the Northeast. In the Northeast, yes. And <laughs> finish that out, yes. You can move to Utah, but yes. <laughs> or Colorado. <laughs> You'd rather say here. Um, so... What what does this mean in terms of um, how UConn's genetic counseling is going to be changing or kind of what you expect to see in the near future with this new program? Well, those are all very interesting questions. They're a little speculative questions right now. A little bit, yeah. Definitely in the infancy of this, um, in a very exciting um, part of this. Um, but I like to think that it'll just mean more um, more fresh ideas around us as we start to prepare for and then have a training program. Um, certainly it'll mean more genetic counseling students buzzing around not just UConn Health but also other Connecticut hospitals um, to train with um, working genetic counselors. And I think that in general the idea of students just excites me because of the enthusiasm that they bring um, and because it just keeps information kind of fresh and flowing. Um, so we're, genetics is a field where you have to be willing to always learn new things. So if you are the kind of person who wants to just like learn what you got to do and then you're set, genetics is probably not the field for you no. <laughs> because it's going to keep changing. You constantly um, have to do your homework. Constantly are learning new things. That's also an area where we're a special part of the healthcare team is that other the, some of the providers that we work with, since this isn't their focus, they don't have that time and energy to dedicate to staying on top of all the new developments. And that's one area where we're 
good for us, but also good for them because we help keep them current with the, all the different changes that are going on. Definitely, and with this new program, definitely excitement on campus. Um, definitely. And it's going to be happening very soon, next couple of years. Very soon. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely keep you guys posted on that. I'm a personal investment in that, <laughs> you know, hoping I can, I can enroll soon. Um, so we've talked about prenatal genetic counseling. Mm -hmm. There's other fields of genetic counseling. There are. <laughs> so how does prenatal compare to other fields? And sometimes you'll touch upon other fields during meetings. This is one thing that I really actually like about prenatal is I feel like prenatal is a specialty where a lot of specialties will filter through it because most people think about building a family at some point. So people with inherited cancer syndromes might think about I want to have children and I'm worried about the risks for them to inherit this cancer syndrome and then that's where prenatal genetics might collaborate with a cancer genetic counselor. So I love that prenatal can be an area where many different specialties come together. Um, some things that are unique about our field, of course we have pregnancy that makes it a little bit unique. Yes. <laughs> um, and I would say one of the big ways that pregnancy changes things is in timing. So a pregnancy is going to continue on whether we consent to it or not. <laughs> and that can definitely change what kind of tests are available to us and how we can use the information from those tests. So some of the testing that's done for pediatric patients is just not time effective enough to be applied to the prenatal field at this point. And a lot of times we'll see testing kind of start with children that are suspected of having genetic diseases and then trickle its way down into um, the prenatal field. But with a pregnancy, we always are mindful of when we're seeing any kind of abnormal findings in pregnancy, you know, at what point in the pregnancy we're seeing that, and then also, you know, what are our options for testing and how will they fit with that timetable as well. So that's one big difference that we have. Um, another big difference is that we, we get to be with people at such an exciting time in their lives. Um, and I would say that most of our news in prenatal is good news. So it is true that when we have bad news, it's usually devastating news um, because it's people's hopes and dreams that they've already thought about for their unborn child and then this news can come and completely shatter that. But most babies are born normal and healthy. So most of the time we are wielding good news and it's very welcome good news. <laughs> and one of the cool parts of your job that I've seen is that you get to call pregnant women and tell them the sex of their babies. Yes, so I that's do. certainly an exciting <laughs> I part. often do and that is a very exciting side effect of all this genetic <laughs> <Yes>. testing. <laughs> So what are some misconceptions when it comes to genetic counseling? There's a lot of things people think genetic mm -hmm. counselors do or they expect. Let's myth bust a couple of these. All right, I've got, I've got three big misconceptions that I, I hope to myth bust for you. Um, one is the misconception that genetic counselors are helping people produce designer babies. That is a big one I hear all a the time. A big one, I, I'm sure you do. Yes. <laughs> so this not only shows kind of a lack of understanding about genetic counseling, it shows a lack of understanding about where our technology is at right now. Yeah, we're not quite there. We're not there. <laughs> I don't really relish the day we will be there <laughs> when it comes to people saying like, so can you pick eye color and hair color? No, <laughs> we can't right now. And like I said, I'm not really looking forward to a day when we can the pick, ethics on that pick is just such <laughs> arbitrary characteristics. Um, so we are definitely not in the business of helping people make designer babies. Um, most of that technology just frankly doesn't exist yet. Um, and most people want to use assisted reproductive technology to prevent really serious diseases. So there's very few people even considering using that kind of technology for frivolous purpose. Most of the time we're talking about a very serious childhood disease that might be, they might be carriers of or that might be in their family, but it's usually not just a matter of, I wish my kid were more athletic. <laughs> yes. Now for that, it's not necessarily that any editing is being done, to be clear, it's choosing certain um, embryos that do right. not have characteristics. So I guess that would be another misconception people have about the current state of our technology is that at this point we're not editing human no embryos. No germline editing. No. <laughs> not now. We're not there now. Um, right now we can select embryos that we can test for different single gene conditions or different chromosome conditions. We can screen embryos to see if they have a chromosome condition 
or carry, or not carry, but are affected with a single gene disorder that the family is aware of. And then we can choose to use those embryos that are unaffected to transfer back to mom. And all of that's through an in vitro fertilization or IVF process. Um, and that's the technology that most people aren't considering for frivolously. That's also a very involved process. Um, more involved, more emotionally draining, more physically draining, and more costly than most people would be willing to do for something that wasn't very important. Certainly, yes. Mm -hmm. So with genetic counseling being such an exploding field, where do you see kind of the future of genetic counseling going, hot fields that are emerging? Mm. Well, I think that the trend is definitely towards expanding the kinds of tests we have available to us. So just in a very short period of time, we've seen whole exome sequencing become clinically available. Um, when I was at Sarah Lawrence, which was between 2010 and 2012, um, exome sequencing just started to come on the scene. For most people, it was just rate limitingly expensive to do on a clinical basis at the time. So it was really more through research. Um, and now, just four years later, it's pretty widespread in the pediatric yeah. world. <laughs> you can kind of meet patients that, yes, we had his whole exome sequence. Absolutely. I mean, we're even updating exome sequences from patients who've had it a few years ago based on the new information that we've learned about different variants that might have been seen in that patient's exome sequence. So quite a bit has changed in a very short period of time. And it's I kind of the theme of things. That's the theme, yes. And I don't see that change slowing down anytime soon. But what these tests do bring with them is a, a higher degree of uncertainty than we've ever had before when we do genetic testing. And that would be a misconception about genetic testing is that many lay people understandably think that genetic testing is very straightforward. You look in a gene, you either see a change or you don't. And really, it's just not that simple. Um, so there's a lot of genetic changes that we just frankly don't know what they'll do. We don't know if they're disease-causing. We don't know if they're benign and just part of the natural variation that exists between all of us. And for a lot of patients, they get a little bit stuck in this kind of gray area where we don't know if the changes we're seeing are really contributing to the disease we might be investigating or if they're not. So that's where genetic counselors are going to be so important is because as all of this gets more complex, it really requires specialists to be on hand for interpreting the information, for relaying it to other healthcare providers, and then relaying it to the patient. And to be a certified genetic counselor, you need to have had a master's degree, which takes yep. around two years, two a little years, longer yep. if you're part-time. So for students that are interested and kind of you've sparked their interest now, mm -hmm. they want to do genetic counseling, what would you suggest to them to kind of um, make themselves a really good applicant for genetic counseling schools? So I would say just stay as engaged with genetics information as you can. So read articles, read books, read magazines, anything you can get your hands on about genetics, like see that as something relevant for you. And also don't be afraid to branch out into popular media articles. Those can be as valuable for preparing to apply to school as a, an academic article. Um, and I think that finding patient stories can be really powerful in learning about not only what genetic counseling is, but trying to see the perspective of a person who might be a candidate for genetic counseling. Um, and being engaged with people's stories is, is something that I think is important for a genetic counselor to have. To be a genetic counselor, you have to find people a little bit fascinating. Yes. Um, you got to be a people's person. And I will say there, there's many counselors who work in labs or in industry who might not have patient contact. But I think it's probably universal for genetic counselors that we find people interesting. We find people fascinating and hearing their stories is always engaging for us. I mean even the counselors that we work with at the lab who never meet our patients, they're still interested in our patients. <laughs> um, so I think that that's probably a, a characteristic of a lot of genetic counselors is that we like to hear people's stories and hear their perspective on things. And especially if you're going to be someone who works with people, you can never hear too many people's perspectives on no. things. So just keep pursuing that. <laughs> read, you know, read as many things as you can get your hands on and stay engaged with the genetics community that way. And NSGC is a great resource. Mm -hmm. You can also find genetic counselors on there. 
um, if you're interested in finding one as a patient or to shadow a general counselor, I can speak from personal experience. It's been uh, awesome to be able to experience what a day in the life of a general counselor is and being able to talk about these things and really just, you know, get a taste get and a learn. Taste. Yeah. And most genetic counselors are very enthused to have students with them. I know that one of the things that a lot of our interested students experience is that it can be very hard to get in the door to shadow because of different legal restrictions that institutions have on student shadowers. So it can be hard, but it's usually not for a lack of the counselor wanting yes, you to the get want is there. <laughs> the want is there. Um, and even if a counselor can't have you shadow, you know, ask if you can just, just interview, just them. meet with them, yeah. just pick their brains about their jobs. Um, you know, many people, if they can't let you observe with patients, are happy to just speak with you. Take more them out about for the coffee. And, yeah, <laughs> hear hear about their life. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been great to hear about prenatal and other fields and kind of get a little angle of genetic counseling. And very exciting to hear about the UConn program. Very exciting. You can go to dnapodcast.com for all episodes and more information at DNA Podcast on Twitter. And all questions you have for me and Brittany, info at dnapodcast.com. I will forward those along Excellent. and Brittany can answer mm. all your all your questions. Now you get a flood of emails. Right? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. And join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.